this is the Politic of Psychic Life of speaker series. Um, well, without further ado, I'd like to present to you Patrick Bieler. Um, I got to know him, as I was saying, through a very compelling paper to me that uh, my friend Rasmus sent me called Nietzsche in Cities Under Pressure, Tracing the Reconfiguration of Community Psychiatric Care and the Housing Market in Berlin published in GeoForum with uh, Martina Klausner. And uh, his presentation is now part of a, a team, I would say, in this speaker series that think about uh, the city, uh, men psychic life, mental health, and try to develop, uh, I would say, a, a view of mental health that is uh, ecological, um, but that also takes into a context broader political process. Um, and also with politics of psychic life, there's the idea of uh, intervention, control. So, um, so the idea is that there are not attempt to uh, manage this interiority of people through various new phenomena, such as digi digital technologies. Okay, and Patrick Bieler is a postdoctoral fellow in the Institute of European Ethnology at Humboldt Universitat zu Berlin. Uh, where he has recently defended his PhD thesis. Currently, he is conducting research in one Berlin neighborhood as part of the collaborative research project, Mind the City. And I hope he will tell us what, why he changed collaborative to, in two words, co, and then tire, uh, laborative. And his main interests are social anthropology of science and technology, medical anthropology, urban anthropology, and human environment relation. So without further ado, Patrick Bieler. Yeah, first of all, um, thank you, Vincent, for having me and, and uh, giving me the, the opportunity to speak um, to, to you in, in Canada, which is very exciting for me. Um, uh, and I would like to also thank Rasmus for, for bringing me in, uh, in, in the first place. Um, and I need to apologize uh, for, being, for being late um, <laughs> because I didn't get that your time was shifting last week. So I thought the presentation was one hour later. Um, well, I, take the so, blame. I take the blame for that. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I, I had to adapt now. Um, okay, so um, can I share my screen probably? Let me check. Um, um, so what I would like to, to do today is um, to go in three steps, I, I would say. Um, first of all, I will give you a brief overview about the context um, uh, of, of my work uh, and my very specific understanding of interdisciplinarity and uh, yeah, collaboration. Uh, I sense I took out the slide for collaboration. Maybe we can, we can come back to that in the end. Um, then I will talk about my, my PhD thesis more in, in detail and um, explain um, how I came to the notion of the encounter or practices of encountering as, as I frame them um, uh, and, and why I think that's productive for, for thinking about issues regarding urban mental health. Uh, and then um, I will go into my current research project, Mind the City, um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll tell you a bit about the research design and how we came up with this. Um, and then, <laughs> come in, come in, come in. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, discuss a couple of preliminary findings. Um, those are a couple of, of guests from Ukraine that we currently host, uh, and they <laughs> were interested in, in, in listening to the talk as well. I hope that's all right. Yes. Um, okay. So, um, so um, my work is part of a longer term interest in uh, the anthropology department at Humboldt University in interdisciplinary collaboration um, 
with psychiatry. Um, so there had been several uh, research projects prior to my project and, and while I was doing my PhD and, and I'm still doing it. Um, I would like to introduce you to especially one. Uh, there was a research project on chronicity as classification uh, with uh, yeah, an STS inspired uh, research question about how chronicity is actually being enacted in clinical practice and what the effects of this are. And why I mentioned this project is because um, uh, it was an interesting project regarding uh, methodological issues um, because what they tried to do was to move beyond the position of a mere participant observer uh, by initiating a joint dialogue with persons from the research field by discussing fieldwork material and the interpretation of this material, as well as key theoretical concepts uh, that are used in both disciplines, uh, so in, in psychiatry and anthropology alike. Um, uh, so for instance, or I think the, the, the most important uh, concept was that of experience that has been opened up uh, for debate. Um, and I tell you this for two reasons. So one is rather, uh, um, yeah, an interesting one. That's for sequential reasons. Um, my PhD was sort of a continuation of that project, and and the outline of my PhD was uh, based on the project's results. Uh, one could say, um, but more importantly, I think. It is to clarify method the methodological background of my own work, and our I understand it's an interdisciplinary work, um, and I have given you the quote um, by Stefan Beck on what he called relational anthropology, um, because I think this is a guiding concept for me and also my colleagues at Humboldt University. Um, that he has developed already in, in 2008. And I think his interest uh, was in discussing novel forms of collaboration uh, in that had been its, in place in STS back then, uh, for instance, George Marcus's and, and Douglas Holmes' work, um, but also um, because he insisted that the theoretical debates that were at stake in the discipline, especially that uh, of the relations between nature and culture. Um, so Stefan Beck insisted that anthropology needs to work closely together with the natural sciences. And I think also needs to change its modes of research if these debates are, are or should be taken seriously. Um, and I will give you the quotes because that really sums up very well the vantage point of, of my work. And that uh, is very closely related to, to what Jörg Niewöhner has then called collaboration. Um, so Beck says, the concept of a relational anthropology does not only force us to, to account symmetrically for materiality, sociality, and symbolic meaning, but requires a new kind of research pragmatics systematically designed for interdisciplinary cooperation, which organizes and makes fruitful relationships between different knowledge systems, thought styles, and modes of research. Hence, relational anthropology necessitates to reconceptualize the own modes of research in relation to other systems of expertise. Um, and because you have asked about, about this notion of collaboration, um, so Jörg Niewöhner drew on th th this rather broad claim on, on relational anthropology and introduced, uh, yeah, let's say hands on uh, methodology um, by introducing that notion. And by this, he meant or wanted to emphasize that. Um, collaborating between these disciplines um, was a practical mode of, of uh, engaging in joint work, but at the same time, always trying to, to, to keep the disciplinary perspectives 
alive in those collaborations uh, and not lose, lose sight of those, but rather try to put them into, into productive tensions, uh, so to speak. Um, and I will try uh, or hope to, to, to make that um, uh, visible in, in, in the presentation as well. Um, so, uh, what did I do in my PhD and why do I include such a, such a uh, hilarious photo of myself handing in the thesis? Um, when we were talking beforehand, uh, Vincent and I, um, uh, you were asking why can I not carry the, the PhD uh, title, although, although I have already defended the thesis. And that's um, because here in Germany, you can carry the PhD title only after having published it. Uh, and so in the process of turning it into a book, you cannot uh, carry the title. Um, but I have uh, handed it in, I think a year ago already and defended it, uh, yes. So is the and book coming to soon? It. What? Is the book coming soon? I hope so. Yes. <laughs> okay. I hope in in the yeah probably a couple of months. Um, and I wanted to make you laugh a bit about the the picture. Uh, to to be honest. Okay. So in in my PhD, um, what did I do? Uh, so this project that I mentioned on chronicity uh, still had a very strong focus on clinical practice, as I already said. But over the course of the years uh, in that project, it already became clear that to appropriately understand why people developed mental health problems or remained ill, it was necessary to do research beyond the clinic. Um, and uh, at nearly the same time when I started my PhD in 2016, um, Scholars in sociology and geography have made claims for interdisciplinary research uh, between the social, social sciences and psychiatry in a way that is very close to, to our understanding of relational anthropology and uh, collaboration. Um, in the right hand uh, picture, you can see a research project from Switzerland uh, that, that took part, I think, uh, yeah, somewhat around 2015 and, and uh, Ola Söderström uh, discussing fieldwork material and he later became my second supervisor. Um, that might be an interesting, interesting insight. Um, so, and what these scholars I think added was an explicit engagement with the psychiatric research uh, that particularly addressed the relations between mental health and urban environments, and uh, from that claiming the need for the social sciences to engage in these collaborations and try to understand better how urban life matters for mental health. And the basic or guiding, guiding questions were, how does it unfold, unfold, sorry, how do people develop everyday routines? How do they deal with aversive environmental conditions? Um, I think um, fundamental uh, to, to the scholars' claims uh, is what, what's on the, the slide right now, um, is what can be called the causal hypothesis within psychiatry that was developed in the 2000s and 2010s. And I'm pretty sure you are familiar with this. So only going uh, in there in a nutshell, um, Psychiatric research basically shows that the risk of developing mental health problems and in particular schizophrenia is higher in urban areas compared to rural areas and is also linearly dependent on the degree of urbanicity. Um, and I think what's important about this hypothesis is that urban life itself um, as an explanation of increasing mental health risks is more probable than alternative explicatory frameworks such as social drift. So people who are already ill moving to specific areas such as, such as urban areas or genetic risk. Um, 
So what have I done in my PhD? Uh, I was trying to identify overlaps of interests between psychiatry and anthropology, while at the same time also pointing out crucial differences um, in concepts, methods, and also ontological assumptions. And based on that, uh, in the PhD, I reflect on potential developments for future urban mental health research by introducing uh, the ethnographically inspired concept of the encounter. Um, and I think that would force both disciplines for methodological developments. Um, oh, sorry. Where am I? Here? No? Yeah. Um, so what, what happened after or beyond the causal hypothesis is that scholars have soon begun to argue that it is important to move beyond demonstrating the evidence of uh, these claims and rather begin to study inner city differences, trying to understand why and how residential contexts such as neighborhoods actually matter. Um, and that goes back um, to, to a very early study by Forrest and Dunham, a classic uh, study uh, from the or, uh, yeah from the circuits of the Chicago School of, of Sociology, um, where they in 1939 already um, showed that the incidences of schizophrenia are distributed very unequally within cities, and you see the map uh, in in the slide. And I think numerous studies uh, in, in current research have supported uh, this finding and, and are working with it. Um, and so I think in, in this shift to studying neighborhoods, uh, it gets uh, directly or immediately becomes visible uh, where the overlaps, but also the differences between the disciplines are. Um, so on the left-hand side in the slide, you can see a table that Nick Manning uh, uh, has in a paper uh, from 2019. Um, and so uh, he sums uh, these approaches up and uh, mostly what they focus on is how social inequalities such as poverty or more broadly social economic status of neighborhoods um, are mediated by in place social network relations, uh, mostly um, theorized, I think, with, with concepts such as social capital or social isolation. Um, and the, the, the obvious overlap in the disciplinary interests is that psychiatry obviously has become more and more interested in understanding the social life of the city, uh, which would also be a classic, I think, anthropological or social scientific uh, research endeavor. Um, but at the same time, Manning also pointed out that the research in, in psychiatry usually operates rather via abstract correlations between social inequalities and social processes. Um, and so he claims that what they do is usually they remain at the level of neighborhood characteristics, um, such as socioeconomic status, and from there deduce social processes rather than really unpacking, unpacking those social relations. Um, and Ola Söderström um, has expanded this critique uh, by reflecting how current research um, follows uh, Chicago School Framework uh, introduced by Forrest and Dunham, and especially, um, yeah, he has he has reflected on on the problematics uh, that that arise from from this legacy. Uh, so Söderström has identified and clarified two problems in there, and I will give you the quote here. So he says, "Social epidemiological approaches analytically decompose the urban into a set of variables such as pollution or criminality." Thereby, the urban, I would argue, is lost as such. The second problem with Faris and Dunham's legacy is conceptual. Social disorganization is the master concept used to explain social and mental health problems in mental disorders 
as in many classic studies of the Chicago School. This concept is both abstract and normative. What organization and disorganization actually mean is hard to grasp. However, a reading of the interpretative chapters of mental disorders shows that it implicitly refers to bourgeois white norms of family and social life. So I think the critique on the one hand supports Nick Manning's problems that broad neighborhood variables do not really adequately picture urban life. Um, and um, so um, what, what Söderström and also Manning and, and others, uh, I think, have claimed is that we need to target how such broad variables are mediated through social processes. Um, and have claimed that an experience-based approach that doesn't reduce the urban, but fully captures how various dimensions of urban life hang together and interact and are being experienced um, is necessary. Um, so which, which introduces uh, the importance of, of ethnography. Uh, I think. Um, in the psychiatric research, however, um, the, the, there's also research targeting the question how neighborhood life is mediated. Um, and I already pointed to this. Um, so there are, I think, two very important concepts uh, guiding the research, which is on the one hand, the social capital approach, and on the other hand, uh, the approach on social isolation. Um, and I have a very detailed um, passage in which I deal with, with both approaches um, and their blind spots and assumptions. Um, I will skip this passage now um, and directly jump into my reading uh, because of time reasons. Um, but if, if, if there are interests on your side, uh, we could come back um, and discuss uh, and discuss later more, more in detail. Um, so where, where I end up um, as an interim conclusion is that uh, social capital and social isolation approaches, I think firmly establish the importance of social relationships um, for mental health, um, but they also introduce a very specific and normative idea of social relations. So they focus usually on what can be called meaningful or strong social relations and face-to-face -face communities. Uh, so, and, and community with a, with a very, um, with the idea of, of, of strong reciprocity among its members. Um, and so, um, yes, and, and they, they are, uh, usually aggregating uh, these forms, uh, especially the, the community networks um, via aggregating uh, social network analyses of individuals. And what, what they are missing, I think, is an ecological assessment of, of neighborhood networks. Um, and I would think that one of the, the reasons for all of this is um, that they um, are based on a dualistic binary conception of the urban uh, that understands the urban either as anonymous or communal. Um, and so basically what is, what is needed here, I think, is an empirical inquiry of actual social relations unfolding in specific places such as neighborhoods and a thorough understanding of, of what the urban environment actually is, what it is composed of and how it emerges. Um, so this is how I came to work with the notion of the encounter. And I borrow here from, from two uh, debates in, in sociology and geography. Um, in sociology, I think the encounter points to what can be called weak or maybe also absent social relations and fleeting interactions um, that might easily be overlooked in social network analysis. Um, and I will give you a quote um, from Mark Granofetter's uh, famous uh, paper, Strengths of Weak Ties, 
in which he deals with absent ties only in one footnote and then for the rest of the paper doesn't mention them anymore. Um, so you will have, a, have an idea of what relations I am after. So Granovetter wrote, included in absent are both the lack of any relationship and ties without substantial significance, such as a nodding relationship between people living on the same street or the tie to the vendor from whom one customarily buys a morning newspaper. That two people know each other by name need not move their relation out of this category if the interaction is negligible. And I would, th I would say or argue and, and hope to show that these relations are surely not negligible, but are highly important in order to understand how the urban affects mental health. Um, a second uh, tradition um, that I draw from, oh, oh no, sorry, uh, is the, the geographical literature on, on uh, the notion of the encounter. And there, um, uh, the encounter or encounters are introduced as one, if not maybe also the most important element of constituting the urban as such, um, because they claim that encounters basically happen all the time. Um, and so the geographical notion, I think, is important because it highlights that places are not simply the background of social relations and can be left aside in, in, in uh, the analysis, but they need to be taken into account seriously and empirically on their own right. Um, and so a focus on encounters as, as urban situational events introduces the possibility to reconstruct empirically how material objects and arrangements are part of urban situations. Um, and I think that's exactly, especially the, the work of Helen Wilson, um, the, the encounter in the geographical tradition also points to um, link it with questions of uh, embodiment. And, and so the, the basic question, how are encounters actually being embodied? Um, so to, to arrive at a provisional definition, um, I have combined these two traditions and have sensitized it with practical, practice uh, theoretical perspectives. Um, and I've come up with a provisional um, definition that, that reads rather cryptic, but I hope uh, to, to show how, how that might make sense. Um, so what I think um, uh, encountering is, is a situated process of humans and more than human elements, oftentimes fleetingly meeting and entangling while they are engaged in other activities. The assembling of human bodies and more than human elements produces energetic flows which constitute elusive atmospheres as environmental conditions that can be sensuously felt and embodied. Encountering takes place in neighborhoods that are simultaneously constituted by encountering. Um, and so I promised to hopefully make that a little more um, graspable uh, with, with uh, empirical material. So I developed this notion um, not only in relation to, to my reading of the psychiatric literature and, and linking with sociological and geographical debates, but also uh, in relation to empirical material that I especially developed in go-alongs with mental health care clients here in Berlin, uh, Germany. Um, I so maybe just to shortly explain what what a go along is. A go along is a method that somewhere sits between participant observation and forms of mobile interviewing. I would say. Um, so basically, the idea is that you follow people on the everyday routes um, and and uh, in their routine activities. Um, and thereby you observe what they are doing um, while also constantly um, 
asking them about their environmental perceptions. Um, and I think I did, um, um, I did those with uh, 10 clients over the course of 18 months uh, repeatedly and, and walk with them there. And I brought you two vignettes. Um, and, oh, here's a mistake, sorry. And, and, and. Oh, okay, sorry, okay. It's only a little mistake. This is vignette one, not vignette two. <laughs> um, I brought you two vignettes um, to, because I think they show very well why the urban cannot easily be understood by isolated factors and how far fleeting relations are of importance to embodied experiences and where we need a thorough investigation of how people build relations to other humans, but also to material elements and places. Um, so I will introduce you now to Barbara. Uh, Barbara is a woman of around 50 years who suffered from depression and lived in the same flat for more than 20 years. And she had a very small radius of only a couple hundred meters around her flat. Um, and I, I accompanied her on that, uh, on her daily routes um, through, through a residential area. Um, I think what this first vignette shows is how absent social ties become present in practices and how place and material elements mediate those relations. And I will read it um, so you will get really a, a sense of, of what happened there. I pick up Barbara at home around noon. We walk up the street. There are some cars driving and numerous people walking or jogging, but they are still individually recognizable. The sidewalk is about three to four meters wide and every 50 meters a tree lines the way. Many houses have retail spaces on the lower floor. There's a pharmacy, a children's store, a youth social work center, a butcher, a snack bar with international cuisine, a late night grocery store and a bakery only in the very limited radius of around 200 meters. First, we shortly walk through the small park, which is located at the crossroads. Afterwards, we go to Barbara's favorite cafe directly opposite the park. We sit down at one of the free wooden tables outside. We order a coffee to go since, it's, since it is cheaper than one to stay. Although this is actually not allowed, she always orders it and then drinks it on the spot anyways. The bakery tolerates this. Barbara describes the cafe as a neighborhood meeting place. Here, many acquaintances often pass by, whom she sometimes engages with in small talk. A short time later, a man walks past us at a quick pace, waving at Barbara. This is the owner, Barbara explains. After drinking coffee, we move on to the late night grocery store next to her house that Barbara visits regularly to buy cigarettes. She tells me that the owner sometimes gives her a small loan at the end of the month when she runs out of money. Oftentimes, she sits down at the small wooden table outside and observes the people walking by. Lately, she has noticed that groups of tourists usually pass by to go to one of the nearby pubs. Sometimes the street becomes a party mess, she says, but that doesn't bother her very much. At least there's something going on here. Today, only an elderly woman comes by who knows Barbara, Barbara from sight, but doesn't know her name. She tells Barbara about a vacant apartment in her house. If Barbara knows someone trustworthy, she could contact her. Barbara notes down the woman's telephone number and then they say goodbye. So what I would like to, to shortly point out is um, the role of, of material elements um, and arrangements here. So the very close proximity of diverse shops where you can eat, drink, relax, medical and social services, as well as cosmetic stores 
um, that are that are very close by. I think this is a, a very in attractive um, infrastructure, not only for residents, but also for them, of course, um, but also attractive for tourists and young people to visit, which becomes obviously here. Um, then there are these various possibilities of sitting outside without needing to pay a lot. Uh, so we have the cafe, um, the late night grocery store, and the park. Um, also, there's a riverbank nearby where, where, where you could sit down and then meet people. Um, and so I think this allows for people to meet who would usually not make appointments with each other. Um, and then uh, last uh, issue that, that I wish to mention is um, the rather banal elements such as trees in the street, um, which are at the same time uh, also um, yeah, important because um, in the summer, for instance, they provide shade. And so in the street, it is still habitable also on warm days. Um, and when I get you to the next vignette, you will see the, the difference uh, that that might make. Um, so now meet Angelica, um, a woman of around 50 years who suffered from schizophrenia and lived in a group home for mentally ill persons at that time. Uh, I think only a couple of hundred meters away from uh, only a couple of hundred meters away from, from Barbara's home. Um, she also has a very small radius in general, but um, as there are not as many shops uh, and cafes and other infrastructure elements around in her immediate residential neighborhood, um, she regularly needs to visit the main road to, to go shopping there. And uh, I will give you a vignette of, of our joint shopping tour. So walking the main street, we have to be careful not to collide with other people passing us, or we have to reduce our speed because other people walk too slow and block our way. Angelica, however, is mainly affected by the traffic. According to her description, the cars passing us on a total of four lanes create the feeling of what she calls a vortex. It feels to her as if she's being pulled into it. To compensate, she holds on to her bicycle, which she always pushes. I notice how noisy it is, especially because it feels like every few minutes, an ambulance with a sounding horn drives past us. When that happens, Angelica covers her ears with her hands. After we have walked through the piercing midday sun, the air conditioner in the organic supermarket provides a pleasant coolness. There are only a few customers in the store. We don't buy many groceries because a small budget does not allow her to buy everything she needs. The rest of the groceries, Angelica wants to buy at the Turkish discounter directly opposite. Inside, it is more crowded than in the organic supermarket. We walk through long aisles composed of high, fully loaded shelves. Therefore, we have to avoid bumping into other people from time to time, just like on the main street. We queue at the counter for fresh food, where olives, meat, and sheep's cheese are sold. Angelica ignores the fact that several people are waiting in front of us and tries to order directly upon arrival. The saleswoman admonishes her harshly. Angelica explains to me that she always sweats when queuing. I joke that this is ironic because it would actually be colder here than the rest of the supermarket. That is true, she says, but waiting really stresses her. When we are finished, we drink a cold iron outside the store because the sun is still burning. After an hour of shopping, Angelica is visibly exhausted. I accompany her home, where she will lie down on her bed and relax for the rest of the day. Um, and so um, 
what I what I find interesting here is that although she only lives a couple of hundred meters away in the same district and in a neighborhood that has a very similar socioeconomic status, um, uh, it is a very different uh, in terms of uh, sociality and her embodied experiences. Um, and I particularly find interesting the main road because actually from, from the density of shops uh, and also the medical and social services, they are quite similar, um, they're both, both uh, streets. However, um, there are quite other kinds of stores. So uh, in, the, in the main road, there are rather uh, stores for shopping clothes, groceries, there are takeaways and bakeries, and, and rather, I would say, um, standard type chains. And people are using that very differently here than, than in Barbara Street, uh, because they rather really rush into and out of the stores uh, rather than lingering. Um, probably, I think that that is um, <laughs> related to the heavy traffic, um, but also I think the lack of, of any green spaces. So there's no uh, single tree in the street. Um, and so, I mean, um, you, you, you could, could hear, I hope, um, how, how that made a difference also in terms of, of being exposed to the sun and, and um, being exhausted from, from that. And I think um, one, one more aspect uh, worth mentioning is that um, the vignette also shows how exhausting mundane activities such as shopping can be um, and how much the location of specific stores actually matter. Um, and also the, the differences between the stores. So the, the um, discounter, the, the cheaper discounter versus the, the more expensive um, uh, um, organic supermarket. Um, but obviously, she's, she's, it's not possible for her to only go to the organic supermarket because, because of her financial situation. Um, so, um, I come now to the current research project. I have a couple of minutes left, right? We started late, so you still have, uh, you okay. still have some time. If you Okay, I, I, I will. Uh, yeah. How much time do you need? I think 10, 15. That's minutes, perfect. Probably. All right, all right. Um, so coming back to, to the current research project, uh, it is also an interdisciplinary project between uh, the anthropology uh, department at, at my university and um, uh, uh, psychiatric, um, uh, department at uh, it's called Medizinische Hochschule Brandenburg, so it's a medical university college in in Brandenburg. Um, uh, the the so so outside of Berlin, um, and uh, what we are trying to do currently is to try to translate my my interests in encounters and and encountering as, as constituting neighborhood life uh, into a more systematized and coherent re research design. So um, in, in this project, rather than focusing on individual actors, as I still did in the PhD with the go-alongs, we have decided for a place-based approach and, and uh, focus on one single street uh, here in Berlin. Um, and that's because um, we thought that uh, the vignettes that I gave you cannot really be assessed well, uh, because each portray only one way of dealing with a very specific environmental embeddedness. Um, and so um, to measure neighborhood effects um, on, urban, uh, on mental health, uh, we thought that it would be important to know how people use and experience the same geographical area similarly and probably also differently. Um, and last but not least, I think that a couple of go-alongs per person 
um, tends or, or yeah, um, affords you affords you to, to miss important details um, that you don't really get a full picture of, of what's going on, um, but rather, uh, yeah, not very detailed um, analysis is possible, I think. So, um, yes, as I already told you, we're trying to capture urban everyday life in and through one street here in Berlin. Um, actually, that's uh, the street uh, in which Barbara from the first vignette is living. Um, and we're trying, yeah, and, and we have been trying to, to uh, no, sorry, that, that was wrong. Um, so what you have already um, seen is that it's a busy but a busy street, but not one of the district's main roads, I would say. Um, and we have chosen the street um, uh, very much because of obvious differences between parts of, of the street. So there's one part, uh, the part uh, in, in the vignette, where the density of shops and infrastructure is very high. Um, and there's another uh, uh, another part where, where this is not the case. Um, so these parts are located um, within two different administrative districts, which might also play a role on, on how people uh, use uh, the, the, the place. And there are very different residents, uh, we would Think. So, so in the one uh, part, uh, it's rather young students and young families, whereas the other part can be, yeah, is, is more or less rather a little bourgeois, if, if you, if you want to have that. Um, and uh, it is also very different in terms of environmental exposures. So they, they are different. Um, regarding the socioeconomic status of, of the residents, um, but also in terms of, of noise uh, and, and uh, air quality, as well as uh, the provision of green spaces, which I think makes, makes the street very interesting. So, and for, for several reasons, so on the one hand, uh, we would like to explain how those differences be between obviously different parts are brought about in everyday practices. Um, but on the other hand, um, we also hope to find unexpected similarities between those parts and expect that we will probably detect differences within what we have so far come to think of as one part of the street. What we're interested in um, is does a couple of questions such as what are shared encounters that all residents are exposed to collectively um, and which encounters are rather specific and dependent on spatial use? How do residents assess the quality of encounters? So are there any specific elements or atmospheres that are experienced similarly or differently? Can we understand why such elements or atmospheres might be assessed differently? So maybe according to types of street use or, or groups that we identify. And how are specific parts, um, elements part of constituting more than one environmental condition? So for instance, cars are involved in creating noise and air pollution. Um, but they are at the same time also the object of conflicts over parking spaces. Um, so, so far we have begun conducting interviews with residents and people working in the shops, cafes and medical and social institutions in the street. Um, and I will give you a couple of, of first empirical insights, but they are really work in, in progress because uh, we have just uh, conducted these interviews. Um, so it's, it's not a proper analysis yet, I think. So what, um, 
we can see, uh, first of all, is that it is a very specific infrastructure that seems to be designed for certain people. Um, so there's an art house cinema, a lot of cafes, bars, takeaways and stuff. So, and one of our interviews um, su summarized it very well by saying, well, previously, uh, I had the feeling that I had to adapt to the infrastructure in place. Well, nowadays, for me as a young middle-class academic, it feels like the red carpet was rolled out for me. Um, but I think um, importantly, this is an infrastructure that does not only attract those residents, um, but also tourists uh, who like to get drunk at night and not very considerate about the residents' needs and wishes. Um, who, <laughs> um, then kids of middle-class families uh, including cargo bikes and berry, berry carriages that minimize the space of the sidewalk and homeless people who on the one hand benefit from specific tolerant awareness or, or a specific form of indifference, but also being able to beg for money in cafes. Um, and what I found interesting is um, that most research partners pointed out uh, ambivalences in the quality of life. So cherishing on the one hand um, to, to know uh, people from, from meeting them in the streets um, and being able to use the infrastructure, while at the same time having to endure, especially the constant noise um, caused by, by traffic. Um, so, um, and that affects obviously sleeping at night uh, highly. Um, so some of, of my interview partners only sleep with their windows shut also in, in summer, but some of my interview partners also don't have very isolating windows. So they hear the traffic anyways at night. Um, and to give you, give you a couple of quotes, one interviewee said, I feel comfortable because it is the only place in Berlin where I feel really at home. When I enter the street, I know every shop, I know the owner of the late night grocery store, I know who opened the new hair salon, and know my neighbors in my building. But I feel like I'm deeply, no, oh, sorry, no. I feel like I'm deeply rooted here. Yet, I don't feel entirely comfortable because it is very noisy. And another interviewee said uh, basically the same. So he said, at the beginning, I've had problems feeling comfortable because of the noise level. I have new windows, and when they are closed, you don't really hear the traffic, but in summer, it is really fierce. And also, I'm concerned about air pollution. Uh, and in, in his case, that, that was really serious because he had a lung disease. Um, so, but, um, yes, and this tension, um, uh, is also, uh, because it, the boundaries between public and private seem to permeate, uh, so you will be affected by street life also within, uh, your own apartment, um, and I think not only uh, regarding the noise caused by traffic, but also people hanging out in bars and cafes, restaurants, and in front of the, the late night grocery stores late at night. Um, that, that can really be felt and sensed in the apartment. Um, and what I found interesting is that this is obviously being very differently assessed. So some say that this is an enlivening atmosphere. Um, Right, so, so one interview partner said, it is nice to look out of the window and see people sitting in the cafe. You almost feel as if you are part of it, but the benefit is that you don't have to be. Um, while others uh, feel that this is really disturbing um, because of noise and, and loitering also. Um, and here the, the, um, one of my interview partners also mentioned that um, people were smoking in, in front of a window late at night. 
So she can not only hear them, but also smell, smell them uh, when she opens the windows. Um, and she, she uh, has a quote that is on the slide that says, well, people walk through the street drunk at night draw and leave their garbage and pee as if no one lived here. Anyway, I have the feeling that this is the attitude of many who move to the district. If you move here, then you just have to accept the noise. But I'm honestly a bit anti. I think to myself, no, you can actually try to keep the city habitable for everyone. Um, and for me, I thought this tension was um, related to two things. So on the one hand, um, a very ambivalent form of, of indifference um, that articulates um, in some people not caring to be very considerate, but also at the same time, people not really sanctioning or judging others. Um, and that on the one hand creates certain possibilities um, and, and freedoms, but at the same time, also exposures. Um, and uh, I think um, in one interview, this became very visible um, regarding the presence of homeless people in public space. Um, so my, my interviewee um, uh, really um, emphasized that she cherishes that in her favorite cafe, for instance, Homeless people um, can come in and are allowed to ask for money, so they are treated very respectfully. Um, the cinema also allows them to sit outside on, on their benches without having to consume anything, uh, without having to drink or, or eat anything. Yet at the same time, uh, she also said that your capacities are also limited. So when I sit outside in the summer, it happens three times a day, every day. But sometimes you just want to have the feeling that everything is good for an hour, but that doesn't work so well. Why that is a problem, uh, I asked, and I think she made clear that um, for her, it was really being confronted with the miserable situation of others and also uh, being confronted with your own conscience. Uh, and that creates uh, this trouble. Um, and so she answered, you are made aware that of course you don't help as much as you could. Then I sit there with my iPhone and know that someone else has no place to sleep tonight. I resonate very much with my surroundings. I cannot really be indifferent. Such an encounter will haunt me for a while. And the second tension um, is that of different rhythms and obligations um, that, that people are, are engaged in. Um, so on the one hand, people working uh, who, who are living there, the, the regular residents, while others, uh, so tourists or people coming to visit, uh, obviously spend their leisure time, leisure activities, um, and they don't have in mind uh, early hours um, and, and people having to get up and stuff. Um, so, but what I found um, interesting or, or puzzling, I, I would say, um, because I, I haven't resolved that yet in my, in my mind, is that at least a couple of, of my interview partners also pointed out that um, people spending their leisure activities actually might increase um, their feeling of safety because, um, and I, I think the, the quote that I give you here summarizes that well, very well. Um, so one of my interview partners said, I assume that people would get involved if something happens and it is not necessarily many people being around. I, want, I would not feel safe at a bus or tramway stop where people are waiting to get to work and don't want to be bothered. But when people spend their leisure activities, then that is something different. Um, and for time reasons, I would think to stop here. I, I have a couple of things of what could we do now or what would we like to do. 
I think only one thing is important to mention. So one of the questions I think that um, we really need to address now, and, and I don't yet know how, is how to actually qualify the importance of those constellations um, and how to evaluate which constellations are more important for mental health than others. Um, the, I think that's, that's a very crucial um, target of, of the research. And um, yeah, we, we, we are really grappling with, with how to do that. Um, so here we end and um, yeah, looking for the Q&A. Okay, thank you so much, Patrick. Uh, so um, I would uh, join me in thanking uh, Patrick Bieler for his uh, very stimulating conversation that uh, I hope will continue in the future. So, uh, yeah, let, let me thank you as well um, for having me and, and for discussing um, and pointing to very different <laughs> uh, difficult uh, <laughs> questions as well i think um, that that will be uh, really worthy um, discussing and then following up um, and as we have a little time in, in the project um, mm -hmm. that will probably really help us in, in further designing our study and, and also coming up with uh, interesting angles on, on how to approach the analysis i guess um, so well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it will be my pleasure to talk with you again. And thank you, everybody, yes. for your participation.